Get me. From Studio A in Arcata, behind the Redwood Curtain, it's time for... Suckatash. Yes, Suckatash, the comedy soundcast, soundcast featuring snippets from comedy... Soundcast. And also interviews with comedians, comedian soundcasters, and other showbiz folk. And now, here's this episode's host from up the coast, the man who puts the X in Xbox and the tie on antisocial... Comedy Soundcast Soundcaster, Tyson Saner. Saner. Insaner. Insaner. Salute on SS me, Tyson Saner, and welcome to Suckatash. I'm your every other week host for this episode, which happens to be number 253. Last week in show 252, show creator Mark Hershon had a chat with none other than Wayne Fetterman, who has been studying the history of comedy for quite some time now. In fact, he has a book out called The History of Stand-Up, from Mark Twain to Dave Chappelle, which you can find on Amazon or by clicking the link on the show's archive blog at www.suckatashshow.com. There is a podcast companion, more or less, to the book, also called The History of Stand-Up, and I clipped it back in December of 2019 for episode 198 of Suckatash, back when it was still called Suckatash the Comedy Soundcast Soundcast. I also listened to every episode of that particular soundcast that had been released at the time. Comedy, after all, has been one of my favorite subjects for a very long time. I encourage you to check out that episode, last week's episode, and pretty much any episode from the past that you have time for. But this week, I've got a fresh trio of clips for you. I've selected snippets from the soundcasts, Corridor Cast, Let's Chat with Chris Revel, and Blank Check with Griffin and David. I've also got a classic Henderson's Pants advert for you around here somewhere, because what would Succotash be without our longtime fake sponsor? Let's get going. First up, Corridor Cast from Corridor Digital, LLC. Its description says, The official podcast of YouTube's Corridor Crew. So that isn't really much of a description. What I can say is that this soundcast is basically, if you like what Corridor Crew do on YouTube, and you always wondered what it was like just to listen to the peeps there chatting about stuff at length, rather than the smaller bits that you get of them in the huge volume of excellent content on their channel that focuses on featuring various types of special effects and other visual arts, including animation and stunt work, both bad and good, in all parts of the world wherever visual arts are created and mostly available to the public at large. They also do many short films featuring an extraordinary level of creative use of CGI, often video game themed, but not always. One of my personal favorites is called Dubstep Guns. Anyway, the clip I've selected is from a recent episode released in April 29th, 2021. It's episode number 89. It's called... Ren's Broken Collarbone and Sam's Lockdown. So, the episode description says, Jake's in town. Ren tells the crew about his recent one-wheeling injuries, while Sam and Nico tell what it was like being under lockdown while having coronavirus. What is that ball for? Oh, this is a stress ball. Oh. So, one of the things about having your arm in a sling all day is that it kind of, like, messes with your muscles in your hand. So, I, like, just... Sorry, hold up. I just activated the wrong muscle. Um, yeah, it's a stress ball. You just squeeze it to kind of get blood pumping through your muscles a little oh, bit here. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, one of the hardest things to get used to about having a broken clavicle is all of all of the ways you use two hands without ever without yeah. ever realizing it. Yeah. And so I'm slowly getting used to using one hand, but it's still like I accidentally activate some muscle without meaning to like i'll just like adjust somehow yeah. or or reflexively do it and it just like it tugs on a bone i was like ah <sighs> it's yeah. very painful but so, only for like half a so second people and sitting so around like, you in the office like are working on the computer then every once in a while <laughs> once in a while Ren's just like <laughs> i know I'm, I'm trying not to laugh right now but that's it's getting me hopefully one day i don't have an injury like that i'm, at, I'm uh, at a point now where it's usually just manifesting as like a cross between a a gasp and a hiccup. So I'm just, I'll be like, <gasps> I think we should all give our impressions of what Ren sounds like when he lightly hurts himself. This is, it's very quick. It's very short. Oh, man. That's, yeah, what, that's, that's, what, that's, what, that's what you did earlier. <clears throat> and like a second ago. And that's what, what my, I, mean, I was doing this because I was like, <laughs> like laughing. God damn it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> he 
should let out a huge one tomorrow. And just... <laughs> Dude, every now and then it'll get I'm bad because just... it's like I will move just the right way and the bones will literally shift. And so my my like relaxed state here is just incredibly mm. uncomfortable. Like mm. it feels like my skin is about to rip because it's like so tight. Uh, and then eventually I just have to keep adjusting until I get the bones kind of like not hurting anymore. Every once in a while, they just go, yikes! When you leave the door. <laughs> yikes! <laughs> yikes! <laughs> oh, wait! <laughs> Sleep, I Mama! Damn, dude. Yeah, sorry. We're not making fun. We're, it's, we're, we're having making, fun together. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm glad you feel that way. Yeah. No, I, I'm honestly, like, very happy that I've been able to be in at least as much of a positive mood as I've been in. I, uh, I, might I, as well, you know? If you're going to have to deal with it some way or another, I mean, might yeah. as well enjoy it. Yeah. Got to yeah. see the positive of it. Otherwise. Yeah, so I mean, it, it's it sucks obviously, and and it sucks for the next few months. But um, I don't know. I don't feel bad about it anymore. I, I yeah. felt very disappointed in myself sense of humor for, about it. for a while. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad you uh, told us the story too. It's yeah. I'm sure everybody's wondering, and now we have like a nice definitive whole story yeah. here on the podcast. Yeah. It, when I think about the actual action, I'm just like, it's just dang man. It's worth mentioning the uh, mustache cut. It's probably out at the time of listening to this, so if you have oh, really? not seen it, people should probably go check it out. Oh, yeah. And people get to look forward to the Attack on Titan video coming soon as well. Yes. I, okay, so that <laughs> video got pushed a week, uh, and oh my god, I'm happy for that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so because of that, we are able to actually do a little bit extra for the intro. We didn't have any intro before now, and all of, my, all of these videos I've made always have some sort of interesting opening shot, and... We ended up coming up with this idea that I'm I'm very pleased with uh, to open the video with. It's on. Did you shoot on, that today? Yeah, that was what we shot okay. on the green screen today. Did you do additional motion capture for the other stuff you had to do? Uh, we haven't done any motion capture yet. Okay. Are you still planning to? Oh yeah, absolutely. Oh. I mean, I can't do it anymore, unfortunately. Yeah. So yeah. I'm gonna have to like really coach Peter specifically what I have in mind because I have like. I have it very precisely choreographed in my mind. Peter's just been up there watching videos of you for the last two days, <laughs> just trying to understand your movements. <laughs> yep. I'm excited for this video because I got COVID. Um, and during that time, uh, because I was locked away from the rest of my family, I could live a bachelor lifestyle <laughs> that's right including i want to binge ask you about all that. of attack of titan oh nice except <laughs> for the final episode of i haven't watched the final of, episode yet either the first half of season four yeah that, maybe I, I, a, I, I watched episode party episode 15 this morning so 16 well I, I don't know when i'll see it but point being incredible show i've been putting that off for years i watched yeah. the first season i started season two and i was just like Ugh. and then i had kids i had no time it was too violent to watch with Gideon, mm-hmm. but oh my god, it is clear. It is such an incredible show. If you're listening to this podcast right now and haven't watched it, it is amazing. So <laughs> go check it out. So you can follow Sam, Ren, and Jake on Twitter. Sam is at MechaForce, that is all lowercase M E C H A F O R C E. Ren is at Surrender, that is capital S I R, capital R E N D E R. And Jake is at all lowercase, J-P-W-A-T-S-O-N. That's J.P. Watson. The show is at Corridor Digital, which is at capital C-O-R-R-I-D-O-R, capital D-I-G-I-T-A-L. And uh, Nico does not appear to be on Twitter. And you can go to their main website, which is www.corridordigital.com. Next up, let's chat with Chris Revel from Core Temp Arts. Its description says, Let's Chat with Chris Revel is a conversational exploration of subcultures. Host Revel uses his behavioral health background and pop culture obsession to connect with guests from the world of punk rock, podcasting, and pop culture. Let's Chat has been featured in Vulture, Huffington Post, and has been in the top 100 comedy podcasts on Apple Podcast. Very cool, good for them. So the clip I've selected is from April 5th of 2021. Uh, The guest is Chris Gethard of The Chris Gethard Show and Beautiful Slash Anonymous. So the episode description says Chris Gethard is a comedian, actor, podcaster, and author. NPR called him, quote, one of our great cultural commentators on comedy slash tragedy juxtapositions, unquote. 
On this episode, Gethard chats about how the do-it-yourself ethics he learned in the Jersey punk scene helped with his comedy career. He also discusses how touring with Mike Birbiglia, former guest of Succotash, led to his role in Don't Think Twice, his stand-up special, Career Suicide, and his latest podcast, New Jersey is the World, and much more. New Brunswick, I went to Rutgers, and and, uh, that scene was always so cool. It actually, sadly, was kind of in a valley... You know, there's peaks and valleys to it. And, and the the years I was there, the Lifetime guys had a house that closed the year I got there. They stopped doing shows. And then it, they there's a bar called the Melody Bar that, that was around for my first year in New Brunswick. It got knocked down. So I think music scene was taking some hits. Um, but New Brunswick is such a beat up town. Yeah. And you know, what's really weird is you talk to a lot of people who are associated with the New Brunswick scene. And I think they'll tell you like in they were simultaneously like the best years of your life in the sense of like, you know, that whole attitude that leads to a basement scene of like, we'll do it ourselves. We'll do it underground. If the cops want to come and shut it down, they have to find it first, but we're going to put up cool stuff and it's going to have a place. But then a lot of people I think would also say their years spent in New Brunswick were simultaneously some of the worst years of their life. Cause it's like a very depressing town. And I think probably a lot of the good art is almost a reaction to that. I I think there's probably something to be studied by some sociologist who's smarter than I am about like, why has so much good music come out of New Brunswick, New Jersey? And I think you go, Oh, it's like a town where you can get lost. It's a town where it's real beat up. It's a town where there's a lot of meatheads and a lot of townies and being the weirdo artistic kid, like you have to link up with the other people who feel like that in order to, and, and the best nights of your life are like hanging out in like a, bed bug infested house that should be condemned. And those are like the best nights, like drinking forties with bed bugs. Yes. People are going to have to make good art and it's going to be art that has an edge and some anger in it because that's the town you're in. But I look at it and go, man, like I started there in 98. So I remember when I was a kid, two of the biggest bands to us were the Bouncing Souls, obviously out of New Brunswick, and then Weston, who we always looked at them as like two companion bands. Weston would come from Pennsylvania, but I always felt like we're kind of honorary Jersey. They played there so much. And, you know, I got there in 98 and you'd see, you'd walk past the house and it was just no, like, Oh, that's the house where the bouncing souls used to live. And then you see, it's just such a clear lineage. That's so cool too, where it pretty clearly goes from bouncing souls to lifetime to the Ergs to screaming females. You're like, Oh, this town has always kind of had like a standard bearer and they, they've always managed to lift up other bands with them and make this town. That's, that's kind of, in many, many ways, kind of just like a shitty little town that should be a blip on the radar. Like bands should not want to stop there. Like you got New York, you got Philly. It's it's very strange. And then I've heard stories that there's bands that will actually like come from Europe and make a point of playing a New Brunswick basement show just because they've heard so much about that scene and they've heard the Lifetime album with that song on it. And I'm going, people are coming from like Denmark and they want to play a basement in New Brunswick. That's wild to me it's wild but again like having been a tangential part of it back in the day having been at a lot of the shows that were kind of swirling around when that happened i go oh right but i also know dozens of people some of whom i knew then some of whom i come to find out later were probably at the same shows i was where you go oh yeah and then we all walked away and became like i don't want to say fighters because it has violent connotations but as Mm. far as like our approach to life and career and and um, all sorts of things in that realm of, of sort of like self determination. You go, oh, a lot of fighters came out of that scene. Like a lot of people were ready to throw down and carve something out for themselves. And I'm, I'm lucky to be amongst that number. Yeah, I, I feel like at least for me, like when I found when I started my I started this show back in 2013. Like it replaced what the scene culture was for me from back then. Like <clears throat> I, I didn't realize until I got older how many DIY ethics I held with me as I went on. It's just like no, just just do it. You just you just. I mean, I, I know it's do it yourself, but obviously it's like you have a community and a network of people. And I, you know, it's and funny too. Like I, I talk about this all the time. Like I remember the first time I ever learned about like animal rights or like uh, like feminism. Or like I guess like more progressive ideals would be like from there's this dude in Connecticut would always like have like a, a vegan straight edge dude with a boatload of tattoos, giant earrings, and he was also a magician. I know just because that's how it was, and he would be like handing out pamphlets about like activism and stuff. And I was like, wait, what? Like I don't know. I was in what like seventeen or eighteen. Like just I, th- I think I actually 
I'm, I'm pretty sure I remember this right, but I'm pretty sure I registered to vote at a Knights of Columbus Hall in Connecticut, in Wallingford, Connecticut, at like a at like a like a, a hate breed show or something like that. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, okay, I guess voting's important. You can find the show on Twitter at Let's Chat Podcast. That is capital L E T S, capital C H A T, capital P O D C A S T. Chris Gethard can be reached on Twitter at capital C H R I S, capital G E T H A R D. And Chris Revel can be found on Twitter at Let's Chat Revel, which is spelled capital L E T S, capital C H A T, capital R E V I L L. And you can go to the show's main website at Let's Chat Podcast dot net. Hello, friends. Summer's here, and thanks to the effect of climate change, it's likely to be hotter than a blowtorch full of Tabasco sauce. <laughs> Who writes these things? Not to worry, the pants engineers at Henderson's Pants have been busy, busy, busy as the proverbial beavers coming up with a sartorial breakthrough that will help y'all chillax your way through the torrid days of summer. Introducing Henderson's air-cooled Culottes. These are the first unisex trousers that feature a high-tech, compact cooling system, guaranteed to keep your prickly heat on ice through the hot and steamy summer months. How does Henderson's do it? The secret is in the ripstop nylon duffel bag that you carry along, which contains a repurposed air conditioning unit from a 1974 Chevy Vega. A sturdy, flexible pipe connects to a valve in the right rear pocket, while a similar conduit vents warm air out of the left rear pocket. Our reliable elastic bands help keep the seals stay tight at your waist and calves, so you'll literally be able to chill your ass out within moments of switching on your air-cooled culottes. Although the air conditioning unit weighs in at a hefty 30 pounds, the complimentary duffel bag comes complete with a comfortable shoulder strap with room to store extra batteries. Originally designed for the Summer Olympic ice skating team, Lawrence of Arabia, and the Sheik, the Sheik, the Sheik of Araby, Henderson's air-cooled culottes can be found anywhere you see our windowless Henderson's vans slowly cruising the neighborhood. <laughs> That's Henderson's. Makers of cool cockamamie contraptions since 1903. And now back to Sakatash. Thank you, Bill Haywatt. Yes, that is a classic Henderson's Pants advertisement from May 14th, 2014. Seven years ago. And finally, the third soundcast I've clipped is Blank Check with Griffin and David from Audio Boom. Its description says, Not just another bad movie podcast, Blank Check reviews directors' complete filmographies episode to episode, specifically the auteurs whose early successes afforded them the rare Blank Check from Hollywood to produce passion projects. Each new miniseries, hosts Griffin Newman and David Sims delve into the works of the film's most outsized personalities in painstakingly hilarious detail. So I first clipped this soundcast back in October of 2018 for a uh, Succotash Clips episode 179 called Equinoxin in Autumnal Style. The clip featured back then was from the episode Running Scared with Paul Shear from March 11th of that year. But the clip featured in this episode is from April 24th of 2021, and it is Ishtar with Clint McElroy. The episode description says... Telling the truth is a dangerous business, but movies and podcasts can go hand in hand. We conclude our Elaine Main series with one of the biggest bounces in Hollywood history, the unfairly maligned Ishtar. Clint McElroy, and in the parentheses it says the Adventure Zone, joins us as we discuss blind camels and the, quote, liberal feminist, unquote, Warren Beatty. Personally, I definitely have a soft spot for this film. The opening always makes me giggle. I'm about due for a rewatch on that too, so hopefully I will get to that soon. I had one of those, you know, you know, far side anniversary books where like Gary Larson offers commentary, right? You know. Oh, really? And I remember him apologizing. He apologizes in the where he's like, I watched this star, it's good. Like Can I can I read his apology? Yes, it's very good. Re- read it, read it properly, yes. So it's just it's just Hell's video store and the entire store is stocked with nothing but copies of Ishtar, right? That's the whole the whole joke. 
It's not his best work. I'm going to no. say this actually. Beyond not liking Ishtar yeah. or liking Ishtar, I love Gary Larson. That one's a five. Out not of 10. not enough cows. But he writes. <laughs> When I drew the above cartoon, I had not actually seen Ishtar. Years later, I saw it on an airplane and was stunned at what was happening to me. I was actually being entertained. Sure, maybe it's not the greatest film ever made, but my cartoon was way off the mark. There are so many cartoons for which I should probably write an apology, but this is the only one which compels me to do so. I do think that's kind of at the root of the entire thing, as you were saying, Clint. Yeah, that's so relative to it because just like you were mentioning that your your sister, yeah. oh yeah, Ishtar, I know Ishtar, and I think that was what it was. It to me, it's the first time I can ever remember because I mean, obviously, I was uh, alive when the movie came out. <laughs> I was alive. Uh-huh. Um, I wasn't con, you know, cognizant of what was going on. No, uh, and it's the first <laughs> time I can ever remember reviews that started, ended. And in the middle of focused on the budget. Oh, yeah. it costs so much money to make. Oh, it costs. It's it, it's you know, it, it it wasn't until you know like reviews of Titanic that I can ever remember. Right. But this was early Water on. World, maybe that's about it. Like yeah. it's that rare thing where it becomes the public discourse for yeah. ordinary people walking into the theater. Is like I heard this thing cost a fortune, and I get if you watch this movie being told it cost a fortune, you might be like, it did. Yeah. Like, what? Why did this cost a fortune? I get that they went to the Middle East, but I mean, to North Africa, but like, what the fuck? The whole story about that framing is so fascinating. But let's also just say, David, Waterworld comes out like eight years after this, right? Nine years after this? It's 95 or 96? Uh, sure. Yeah. Mid 90s. What is it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and when the press was writing about Waterworld going over budget and over schedule, they called it fish tar. Well, that's funny. The sh- it's great. I gave them five comedy points, but the shadow of Ishtar was so large. They did also call it Kevin's Gate, of course. Oh, no, no, that was da- Dances, Dances with, with Wolves. Wolves. They called Kevin's right. Gate. Right, yes. Because yes. Costner was in a similar position to Beatty, one could argue, where they were like, we're just ready for you to fucking fail, you egomaniac. Yeah, you you hot asshole. You right. think you can make movies and star in them and win Oscars? Yeah, we're coming for you, buddy. Yes. And then Dances with Wolves, you know, is a huge hit. Then they're like... Well, all right, you got away with that one, but we're still watching you, buddy. And I think one of the great crimes of of, of Ishtar and the way it was handled and the way it was treated was that, it, it, to me, a lot of and and like you, I love this movie. Yeah, um, there are things about this movie that are some of the funniest gags, some of the funniest scenes I have ever seen. Um, but. The fact that the failure was was laid on Elaine May and that she paid the price for it, it seems. Right. When I think a lot of the problem should have been dolloped on on uh, Warren Beatty. Yep. And and so I it just that's that's what makes me a little crazy. I think that she made some some mistakes. <laughs> yeah. Um. I think that that you know, but the the whole and I'm sure we're going to get into this, but the the whole concept of the movie to me the first half an hour of it is one of my favorite movies of all time agreed agreed it's agreed brilliant. that's exactly what i say to people let's also just say clint uh this might be the longest we have had an episode with a guest oh on the spreadsheet because it was uh, <laughs> uh new york comic-con 2019 oh i remember those days yeah, I think it was it's fully like 18 months ago that we like figured this out. Right. Yes. It was like September or October 2019, I think September, and uh I I had done the Adventure Zone uh panel with you guys. And then uh Travis threw like a little party afterwards and it was your first time meeting David. That's right. Um and you came up to us at the bar and said, "Guys, you've had all three of my sons on. When am I going to get to come on Blank Track?" <laughs> And we said, here are the things we have planned for the next whatever, whatever we had on the books at that point in time. We thought we were going to do a lane May, April 2020. What happened? Two things happened. (laughs) We've gone over too many times. One, we wanted to do this March Madness bracket where it was Razzie winners versus Oscar winners. Uh And Elaine May was the only female who fit into either bracket who we hadn't covered already. So we had to take her out. When's the Razzie for for this year movie? For this movie. 
Right. So we were like, we have to put her in competition. Otherwise, it's going to be even more of a sausage fest than already is. And also, there was this announcement, or not even announcement, this whisper, maybe she's going to make a new movie with Dakota Johnson. And we said, maybe let's wait and see if she makes this new movie. Then a global pandemic happened, and we were like, maybe let's not wait. Who knows when movies are going to be made? There was a global pandemic? Clint, I'm I sorry, see. spoilers. I, know, I hate to break this, too. I, I forgot that you're behind. Yeah, I, I mean, I live in Ohio, so we don't know what's going on. Uh, well, you can find Griffin Newman on Twitter at Griff Lightning. That is capital G R I F F, capital L I G H T N I N G. You can find David Sims on Twitter at David L Sims. That is all lowercase d a v i d s i m s. I cannot find Clint McElroy on Twitter, but I can find his son Travis McElroy and uh, Justin McElroy and Griffin McElroy. And I understand if that is not helpful. There's also Rachel McElroy. Thing is, I don't know enough about these people to know if they're all related or not, and I feel kind of bad about that. But you can find all of them on Twitter. So if you go to the Wikipedia link of Blank Check with Griffin and David, it turns out that their website list on there is on Audio Boom. So I recommend going to the Wikipedia and scrolling down to the end of that description and clicking there if you'd like to see their main website. But you can find them on SoundCloud and Apple Podcasts and many other places where you can find Soundcasts to listen to. Yes, indeed, it is the end again. And here we are together. I wanted to mention that I received my second vaccination shot a few days ago and was fortunate enough to have minimal side effects. I also changed my appearance significantly earlier today because why not? I've been sporting a Van Dyke under my mask that only my wife and son and maybe my mom once and anyone who follows my Instagram at REVT23 were able to see for over a year now and the hair on my head really went for it too. Mostly as an addition to what was pretty much a COVID Van Dyke, I also had a COVID ponytail, as it were. Both of those things sound really awful out loud and they don't look so good on the page either. And ultimately I was tired of them. I filmed the whole thing, and my two-year-old son Jareth was there as it was happening because I get really freaked out thinking about him getting freaked out about things. So in my head, it's like he was maybe going to be like, why does daddy look different? Or worse yet, who is that? And it's hard to say whether it would have made a difference or not, but I'm glad I did it anyway. Other things I'm glad about is that recently, the CDC announced that fully vaccinated people will most likely be okay if they don't wear masks and want to get close to other people, especially other vaccinated people. That means I can hug my at-risk family members now and not worry about killing them, so that's nice. Having to do with that, the only thing I worry about is the people who aren't vaccinated who never wore masks or socially distanced, and now we won't be able to tell them from the vaccinated people who are choosing not to wear masks in public. Now. Yes, I use the word now twice, in a very awkward, clunky fashion. Anyway, it's the worry that one who has active empathy for their fellow human beings has. Also, I think about death all the time, so there's that. Thank you for listening. Be decent to each other, and please share the show with others, because it really helps us out, as does subscribing to us, retweeting us, and writing reviews when and wherever that's applicable. It's what we mean when we ask you to please pass the Succotash. You've been listening to Succotash, the comedy soundcast soundcast, with your host, Tyson Sainer, brought to you by Henderson's Pants and... Imagine your company's name right here. Rate us and review us at Apple and Google Podcasts. Find us on the web at SuccotashShow.com, on Spotify, on Stitcher, on iHeartRadio, on YouTube, on SoundCloud, and wherever fine soundcasts are streamed and or downloaded. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Suckatash Show. Like us on Facebook. Email us at T-Y-S-O-N at SuckatashShow.com or call into the Suckatash Skype line at our toll call number 818-921-7212. That number again is 818-921-7212. You can also upload clips from your favorite comedy soundcasts directly to us using our direct upload link at Hightail.com slash you slash 
slash Succotash. Succotash is produced and engineered by Joe Paulino through the auspices of Studio P. Sausalito, the home of the hit. Our hosts are Mark Hershon and Tyson Sainer. Our musical director is Scott Carvey. Our booth assistant is Kenny Durges. Succotash is executive produced by Mark Hershon. Until next time, I'm your loyal booth announcer, Bill Haywatt, reminding you to please pass the Succotash. Goodbye. This has been a Succotash Patch production. <laughs>